as from the 15th day of August, 1947, two independent dominions shall be set up in India, to be known respectively as India and Pakistan. The 3rd of June, 1947, sealed the fate of South Asia. On this day, it was announced that the British Crown was to hand over power to two dominions, India and Pakistan. Bengal and Punjab were to be vivisected and divided between the two dominions. Now, the actual partition lines were, of course, drawn by a British lawyer, a judge called Radcliffe, uh, who came to India in the summer of 1947 and very quickly he had to decide where the partition axe was to fall on Punjab and Bengal. Sir Cyril Radcliffe was a wealthy, reserved, stocky, fastidious man with a protuberant forehead poor eyesight and a slight twist at the corners of his thin lips. After leaving Oxford, he enjoyed immediate success as a barrister, combining an incisive legal mind with a capricious memory. He was the ultimate establishment figure who could be trusted to put interests of the state before any other consideration. In 1947, he was 48 years old and was soon to be commissioned a task that would be a turning point in his life and in the lives of 400 million subjects of the British Empire. Unbiased at least he was when he arrived on his mission. Having never set eyes on this land, he was called to partition. Between two peoples fanatically at odds, with their different diets and incompatible gods. Time they had briefed him in London is short. It's too late for mutual reconciliation or rational debate. The only solution now lies in separation. Radcliffe arrived in India on the 8th of July, 1947. For the first time, he was setting foot in Asia. His unfamiliarity with the subcontinent was viewed as a desirable quality. He would be unprejudiced and impartial, thought both Nehru and Jinnah. Earlier, on the 30th of June, 1947, the Boundary Commission for Punjab and Bengal Assam had been set up by the Viceroy, Lord Mountbatten. Each commission had four members, all High Court judges two nominated by the Congress and two by the Muslim League. Sir Cyril Radcliffe was nominated the chairman of both the commissions. He was put up at a house on the Viceregal Estate in New Delhi. He had exactly 36 days to demarcate boundaries. On the basis of ascertaining the contiguous majority areas of Muslims and non-Muslims, and in doing so, to also take into account other factors. The other factors would include administrative viability, natural boundaries, communications, water and irrigation systems. The Viceroy thinks, as you will see from his letter, that the less you are seen in his company, the better. So we've arranged to provide you with other accommodation. We can give you four judges, two Muslim and two Hindu, to consult with, but the final decision must rest with you. Sir Radcliffe was no cartographer. In six weeks, he had to rip apart a country whose cultural and economic tapestry had been intricately woven over millennia. He had no time to appreciate the nuances of the tapestry he was about to rip off. 
he had no time to feel the warmth of the eastern sun on his shoulders or smell the freshly harvested paddy. He had no time to measure the pulse of the people who prayed five times a day or who took a dip in the holy river to absolve themselves of the sins committed. He had no time to fathom the enigma that was India. So he locked himself up in his bungalow and settled for a paper exercise. To identify the Muslim majority areas in Punjab and Bengal, he was given a pile of maps and the 1943 census report already four years out of date. Shut up in a lonely mansion with police night and day, patrolling the gardens to keep assassins away, he got down to work, to the task of settling the fate of millions. The maps at his disposal were out of date and the census returns almost certainly incorrect. But there was no time to check them, no time to inspect contested areas. The weather was frightfully hot and the bout of dysentery kept him constantly on the trot. Braving the sweltering July heat of Delhi, Radcliffe's pen traversed deserts, climbed Himalayan ranges and squiggled through the mangrove swamps of the Sundarbans. The other members of the Boundary Commission the Hindu and Muslim judges were there to help him take into account the human face of partition. They knew where the roads, rivers, canals and railways ran. They were also familiar with the emotional territory of the subcontinent's people. Hindu judges argued. Lahore is the cultural hub of Punjab. It belongs as much to Muslims as to Hindus. Besides, there is a holy shrine of the Sikhs just beyond Lahore. The Muslim League hoped for a wider share of Bengal that would include Calcutta, they argued. The census report shows 35% Muslim population in Calcutta. Radcliffe found their advice to be along communal lines. He decided to rely on his own resources. Radcliffe and the Viceroy kept a discreet distance from each other. But Radcliffe obtained an agreement from Nehru and Jinnah to include the word award in the Indian Independence Bill. The awards of the Boundary Commission, whatever they might be, were to be accepted and to be enforced impartially. Radcliffe's pen covered up to 45 kilometers a day. Calcutta and all other cities were left intact. But the countryside was ripped apart rather carelessly. The Radcliffe Line passes along the length of the last 124 kilometers of the river Ichamati before it unites with the Bay of Bengal. On the banks of the river Ichamati is a tiny village called Panitar, out of bounds of the common people. For visiting one's relatives in this village, the civilians have to pass through a rigorous security check and deposit their identity cards with the border security force. The Radcliffe Line zigzags through this village. Both Indians and Bangladeshis come to pray in the tiny mosque of Panitar. A few paces away, the small pond falls in Bangladesh. Radcliffe was tormented. He had a premonition of the violence that this act would unleash. He wrote to his stepson, Nobody in India will love me for the award of Punjab and Bengal. There will be at least 80 million people with a grievance who will begin looking for me. Six million Sikhs were isolated by the raging battle between the Congress and the Muslim League. There was no representation of Sikhs in the Indian National Congress. The 1943 census report lacked a true representation of the Sikhs. The rapidly formulated June 3rd plan ignored the position of the Sikhs. 
The Sikhs were spread out all over Punjab. There were substantial Sikh pockets in West Punjab. The governor of Punjab, Evans Jenkins, warned the Viceroy. I apprehend large-scale disturbances in Jalandhar, Amritsar, Lahore, Lialpur and Montgomery. In July, the Boundary Commission received a Sikh memorandum. It suggested that a frontier running along the Chenab River would keep the important shrine of Nankana Sahib out of the Muslim hands. But this would have left very little of Punjab with Pakistan. The Muslims threatened the British government that an unfair division of Punjab would seriously jeopardize future relations between Britain and Pakistan. After all, the P of Pakistan stood for Punjab. Faced with a difficult choice, Radcliffe went back to work. The memorandum of the Sikhs could not be conceded, but Amritsar would no doubt be in India. The district adjacent to Amritsar was Gurdaspur with a 51% Muslim population. Would it be given away to Pakistan? But that would make Amritsar extremely vulnerable. Punjab is an agrarian state. The fertility of the soil is maintained by the crisscrossing irrigation canals. Radcliffe made several attempts in early August to put common canal systems under joint control. But this proved politically impossible. So he made an indentation in Firozpur district to award the Sutlej headwater to Pakistan. The map of Punjab with a line of division running along its length was sent to Sir Evans Jenkins, the governor of Punjab. The Firozpur salient looked problematic to everybody, too vulnerable a spot. On the 10th of August, Sir Jenkins got a cryptic telegram from the Viceroy's house. Eliminate salient. The Radcliffe line was straightened out. Whole of Firozpur and much of Gurdaspur remained in India. The advance news of Radcliffe's draft plan provoked an upsurge of violence. Almost 400 people had been murdered in Punjab and Amritsar was burning. Governor Evans Jenkins sent another telegram to the Viceroy. General situation deteriorating. The communal holocaust was now underway. Even today, the original residents of Gurdaspur are sometimes mistaken as infiltrators from the neighboring country. They are punished for the acts of treason they might never have committed. Wasted lives, truncated careers, all in the name of the country. Mistrust for the other, who was once the brother. Secret missions to the enemy country, who was once one's own. To His Excellency, the Governor General, I have the honor to present the decision and award of the Bengal Boundary Commission, which by virtue of the Indian Independence Act 1947. Radcliffe's job was done. Awards of the Boundary Commission were submitted to the Viceroy on the 13th of August. I can only hope that arrangements can be made and maintained between the two states that will minimize the consequences of this interruption as far as possible. Cyril Radcliffe. the 12th August 1947. The Viceroy left for Karachi on the same day. Uh, Jinnah made an extraordinary suggestion in July. He wanted to convene the first meeting of the Pakistan Constituent Assembly in Delhi. So he had still not been reconciled to a Pakistan being um, confined to the 
northwestern and the eastern extremities of the subcontinent. Now, of course, the Congress leaders, especially Patel, would not hear of the Pakistan Constituent Assembly being convened in Delhi. So ultimately, the uh, first meeting of the Pakistan Constituent Assembly had to be convened in Karachi on the 11th of August of 1947. Ratcliffe wrote to his stepson. Down comes the Union Jack on Friday morning and up goes, for the moment I rather forget what, but it has a spinning wheel or a spider's web in the middle. But in seven weeks it was done. The frontiers decided, a continent for better or worse divided. The next day he sailed for England, where he quickly forgot the case, as a good lawyer must. Return he would not, afraid, as he told his club, that he might get shot. On the 14th of August, 1947, Muhammad Ali Jinnah took oath as the first president of Pakistan. I sincerely hope that with your support and your cooperation, we shall make this constituent assembly an example to the world. The whole world is wondering at this unprecedented cyclonic revolution, which has brought about the plan of creating and establishing two independent sovereign dominions in the subcontinent. And it was at that meeting that Jinnah made his now famous and controversial speech where he said that you are free to go to your temples, you are free to go to your mosques, and that uh, religion has nothing to do with the business of the state. Uh, and uh, uh, that is uh, the uh, speech uh, that is often you know, quoted uh, even today. In course of time, Hindus would cease to be Hindus, and Muslims would cease to be Muslims, not in the religious sense, for that is the personal faith of each individual, but in the political sense, as citizens of the state. Back in India, when the country prepared for Independence Day celebrations, Radcliffe's plane was being thoroughly searched for possible assassins. On the 15th of August, 1947, Jawaharlal Nehru took oath as the first Prime Minister of India. At the stroke of midnight, when the world sleeps, India will awake to life and freedom. A moment comes, which comes but rarely in history, when we step out from the old to the new, when an age ends, and when the soul of a nation, long suppressed, finds utterance. Gandhiji skipped the Independence Day celebrations and anchored himself at 151 Velegata Road in Calcutta, to avoid the carnage of 1946. Radcliffe left Delhi on August 15, 1947, one of the first Englishmen to depart after independence. Interestingly, Radcliffe's decision was not made public until the 17th of August, 1947. So when Pakistan came into being uh, as a dominion in, on the 14th of August and India on the 15th of August, neither country knew where exactly their borders were. Uh, and that created even more confusion uh, in the border areas. The Boundary Award was announced on the 17th of August. It did not please anybody, neither India nor Pakistan. Just by a stroke of pen, neighbor became an alien. Confidence and companionship suddenly seemed to vanish, replaced by fear and mistrust. Uh, Mountbatten didn't want the actual Radcliffe decision to interfere with the festivities surrounding independence. Uh, and he was uh, someone who was given to self-congratulation. And he was saying that within a short period of time, he had carried out one of the greatest administrative operations in history. And what was this greatest administration, uh, administrative operation in history achieving? It, you know, it was resulting in killings on a massive scale. Hindus and Muslims and Sikhs fell upon each other in August 1947 and its aftermath. 
and millions and millions of people became homeless as they fearfully crossed the newly demarcated borders of uh, August uh, 1947. So a colossal human tragedy was being enacted exactly at the time that Mountbatten was congratulating himself that he had carried out one of the greatest administrative operations in history. Sir Radcliffe returned the £2,000 fees to Her Majesty's government. He destroyed all drafts and documents of the project and remained tight-lipped for the rest of his life. In addition to partition, what happened on the 14th, 15th August 1947, that both countries got dominion status. Uh, the Congress compromised on two counts. They had always believed in the unity of India. That they were prepared to sacrifice in order to get power at a strong center. Partition took place. They had also been calling, at least since 1929, for Purna Swaraj, or complete independence, not dominion status. But it is sometimes forgotten that what India got in on the 15th of August was not complete independence, but dominion status, with Mountbatten as the governor general. The earlier precedent was Ireland, after the end of the First World War. And uh, something very similar happened in India in 1947. In Ireland, uh, there had been, uh, of course, a Catholic majority and the Protestant minority. But in the northern province of Ulster, there had been a Protestant majority. Uh, Ulster consisted of nine counties. And when Ireland was partitioned, it was not just Ireland that was partitioned. Uh, Ulster as a province was partitioned. Six counties where the Protestants were in a majority became Northern Ireland. And three counties in which Catholics were in a majority uh, were attached to what was then called the Irish Free State. And then Ireland, of course, became a full republic only in 1937. So, just as the partition of Ireland involved the partition of Ulster, six counties with Protestant majority becoming Northern Ireland and three counties with a Catholic majority being attached to the rest of Ireland, so also partition of India actually involved partition of Punjab and Bengal with Muslim majority districts by and large going to Pakistan and Hindu majority districts by and large coming to India, even though it wasn't that simple either, the Radcliffe line was very, very problematic in the end. <laughs> India's independence marked the beginning of an end. It heralded the end of European colonialism that had begun in 1492 when Christopher Columbus landed in the New World. were of course drawn by a British lawyer, a judge called 
Radcliffe, uh, who came to India in the summer of 1947. And very quickly, he had to decide where the partition axe was to fall on Punjab and Bengal. Sir Cyril Radcliffe was a wealthy, reserved, stocky, fastidious man with a protuberant forehead, poor eyesight and a slight twist at the corners of his thin lips. After leaving Oxford, he enjoyed immediate success as a barrister, combining an incisive legal mind with a capricious memory. He was the ultimate establishment figure who could be trusted to put interests of the state before any other consideration. 1947, two independent dominions shall be set up in India, to be known respectively as India and Pakistan. The 3rd of June, 1947, sealed the fate of South Asia. On this day, it was announced that the British Crown was to hand over power to two dominions, India and Pakistan. Bengal and Punjab were to be vivisected and divided between the two dominions. Now, the actual partition lines... ...clarity with the subcontinent was viewed as a desirable quality. He would be unprejudiced and impartial, thought both Nehru and Jinnah. Earlier, on the 30th of June, 1947, the Boundary Commission for Punjab and Bengal Assam had been set up by the Viceroy, Lord Mountbatten. Each commission had four members, all High Court judges, two nominated by the Congress and two by the Muslim League. Sir Cyril Radcliffe was nominated the chairman of both the commissions. He was put up at a house on the Viceregal Estate in New Delhi. He had exactly 36 days to demarcate boundaries. On the basis of ascertaining the contiguous majority areas of Muslims and non-Muslims, In 1947, he was 48 years old and was soon to be commissioned a task that would be a turning point in his life and in the lives of 400 million subjects of the British Empire. Unbiased at least he was when he arrived on his mission. Having never set eyes on this land, he was called to partition between two peoples fanatically at odds with their different diets and incompatible gods. Time they had briefed him in London is short. It's too late for mutual reconciliation or rational debate. The only solution now lies in separation. Radcliffe arrived in India on the 8th of July, 1947. For the first time, he was setting foot in Asia. His unfamiliar